So, let's start today's lecture by a brief review of what we learnt last time. So, we ask the question whether we can have a probability on n such that the space of all multiples of a in n would have probability 1 over a for any a. So, 1, 2, 3 and so on. The answer was no. And this, this is the reason why we need probabilistic number theory. So, instead what did we do? We define the following measure. probability nu sub n on the set of natural numbers as follows between the first capital N numbers so nu n of some number a is equal to 1 over n if a lies between 1 and capital N and outside of this, this is just 0. You can check that this indeed defines a probability and what we have is the notion for a sequence A contained in N, what we do is we define the notion of the natural density which turns out to be, which by definition is the limit as N goes to infinity of nu sub N of A. Okay. And the good thing about this density is that density of the set of all multiples of natural number by any A indeed turns out to be equal to 1 over A. So while we do not have a probability on N satisfying this condition, we have a limited law of probabilities which we call density which satisfies this. Now, next question is of course the study of random variables. Now, all along in this course we have been looking at arithmetic functions so in for now let us focus on real valued arithmetic functions. And what happens here is that we do not study this as a random variable on n. Instead, what do we do? We define f of mu sub n. So, f on the space of natural numbers with the probability measure mu sub n and we study this. So, this is basically, so uh, this is, so we study this as a random variable on the probability space of n and uh, equipped with the probability mu sub n, right? And now the distribution function, so let 
f sub n or since we are using uh, uh, yeah we can call it f sub n or le let's call it capital f sub n b the distribution function okay of this random variable f equipped with the probability mu sub n okay then what we do is we take limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of z okay we call this capital f of z this is called the limiting distribution function of f so instead of just looking at distribution functions of random variables we are again taking the limit of those distribution functions and that limit is what is called the limiting distribution function now by definition what is this this by definition is so limit as n goes to infinity okay what is uh, f sub n of z it is 1 by n times the number of n up till capital n for which f of n is less than or equal to z this is the distribution function corresponding to this random variable here and this is the limit and you will see if you relate this to the things that we started this class with value distribution of arithmetic functions we have put a probabilistic spin on the entire study and this reveals a lot of information and and a way forward which uh, analytic methods like the partial summation or the idea of converting a, an arithmetic function, taking an arithmetic function and studying its Dirichlet series. These are the typical analytic methods you people have learned. This probabilistic approach is a complementary approach. It gives you information and a way forward which those methods may not necessarily give you. So how does that work? Well, there is the ideal world and then there is the real world. By real world, I mean by ideal world, it's like a fair world, what we need, right? We want probability on n, but what we end up having is a limit of probabilities okay then we would want to be able to study an arithmetic function in terms of uh, as a random variable on n but that does not happen rather this is more and distribution function corresponding to these random variables what ends up happening is you end up taking limits of distribution functions so now in the ideal world setting we have the entire theory of probability to predict various types of properties what happens to the value distribution of your arithmetic function f if you were able to treat them in this setup so this setup will give you predictions but not concrete proofs because before we start a concrete proof we have to remember we are in the real world we are in the limiting situations so we use this 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 setup to make predictions make guesses and we use this setup and some hardcore number theory to prove those assertions or or check whether those assertions hold in this generalized uh, setting or not 
So, this is a brief summary of why probabilistic, what probabilistic number theory does. Okay, now the other notion that we studied and this is extremely important for us, actually before I define it, let us just talk about f with respect to the probability nu sub n. What is the expectation of n? E sub n of f. We saw that this is what you in the language of number theory called average order of a function. So, 1 by n summation n less than or equal to capital N f of n, the average order. Next question is what is the variance of this random variable? This by definition is 1 over n summation n less than or equal to capital N f of n minus the expected value whole square. So, the expected value is what is te it's telling you what you call the average order and the variance is what leads you to the study of normal order. You had asked me last time what is the difference between average order and normal order. So, this leads to the notion of normal order and in this week we are going to learn techniques to derive normal orders of functions. Now, a concrete definition and a nice way of looking at that definition which is due to Turan and leads to a beautiful technique called the Turan Cubilius inequality, is what we are going to discuss. So, what is the normal order of an arithmetic function? I am going to focus on real valued, but these can be generalized to complex valued by taking real part and imaginary part separately. So, we say that f has a normal order g, where g is some function which is defined on a domain containing n if the following happens, if limit n as n goes to infinity 1 over capital N and so what happens is if for every epsilon greater than 0, the number of n less than or equal to n such that the difference between f and g is less than epsilon times absolute of g of n. Okay, so if what happens is if this limit is equal to 1. Okay? In other words, almost everywhere on n, you would expect that the difference between f and g would be a very, very small multiple of g. Okay? And th this, this epsilon can be arbitrary. Now, this may look like a strange definition. So, uh, we will, of course, we are going to spend, this is one of the main topics of our course. So, we are going to spend a lot of lectures understanding this. So, 
Now, another alternative version of this. Equivalently, the number of n for which this does not happen has to be of density 0. So, equivalently, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the number of n less than or equal to n for which absolute f of n minus g of n is greater than epsilon is equal to 0, okay, for any epsilon greater than 0. This is another equivalent formulation of the defining property I wrote before. Now, what does this mean? Notice, so this is a trick that we applied when we studied a baby version of the Hari Ramanujan theorem in the first week, I think. What is this actually counting? Sometimes just writing the definition in a slightly different way exposes us to a new way of understanding a topic. Okay, so this was actually looks like a very, very basic idea, but to think about it is in a way, it is actually a work of genius and it, this is what led to very nice techniques to study the normal order. So, this is Turan's observation, what does he do? If you look at the second formulation, what is this actually? This is 1 over n summation over all the n going from 1 to capital N for which this condition holds absolute f of n minus g of n greater than epsilon times 1. So, the number of uh, elements satisfying a certain property is just a sum of all those elements with the weight 1, right? Sum of all the weights with weight 1 of those elements satisfying that property. Just another way of writing the same thing. Okay, now, now comes the other interesting observations. This can be written since absolute of f minus g is greater than this, what that means is that the ratio absolute of f minus g over epsilon times absolute of g is greater than 1, right? In other words, 1 is strictly less than that ratio. So, all I am saying is I am going to write this as summation 1 by n, n going from 1 to n absolute of f of n minus g of n over epsilon times g of n. Okay, And since this is something greater than 1, the square of that number is obviously greater than that. So, 1 is less than the square of this. Okay, so, this, this quantity here is certainly less than actually. Uh, so, yeah, it's if, if it is strictly less than that, there is nothing wrong in writing less than or equal to. And furthermore, now, uh, of course, this is only running over those for which is greater than epsilon times g of n. But notice that even if we consider those n's for which this relationship does not hold, if we add those terms, it will not affect the inequality because that is just a sum of a bunch of non-negative numbers. So, this is actually not needed. So, this is Turan's observation. 
that if we can show that the above sum okay and since we are in for now we are considering real valued functions so we can just write this as okay if this is equal to 0 then this limit also has to be 0 since it is less than or equal to this sum. So, if you can show that this sum limit of this sum is 0 then g is a normal order f ok we are going to use this formulation. So, just another brief uh, recap of the difference between average order and normal order. So, if g, so if f has average order g, what that means is limit f of n okay that so rather this is asymptotic to g of n as n goes to infinity Okay, when we say asymptotic, what does that mean? That that is the above sum, the average value of the function up till capital N is equal to g of n times 1 plus little o of 1. Right? And then for normal order, however, what we have is something stronger than this. Okay, uh, so what it says is not the average, what it says is that f of n is equal to g of n 1 plus little o of 1 almost everywhere on the set of natural numbers. Okay, so, you can now reflect upon, reflect carefully upon these notions and the difference between them. Okay. We are particularly interested as I mentioned before in this course in the case of arithmetic functions which are additive. The techniques that we are going to learn apply to additive functions. Later we will also discuss what happens when a function is multiplicative, but today we, we will just take additive functions. So, f from n to r is said to be additive if f of the product of two co-prime numbers is equal to f of m plus f of n if gcd of m and n is equal to 1. Okay. So, for example, uh, in fact, uh, example is the function that we have been studying a lot in this course f of n is the number of distinct prime divisors. If we take the number of prime divisors counting multiplicity that is also an additive function and the treatment of that function is very similar to this. But there is a fundamental difference between the other omega of n. So, 
an additive function is said to be strongly additive if whether you take a prime power or just the prime, the value of the function will not change for any okay and we usually we, we assume f of 1 to be equal to 0. So, we are interested in uh, functions which are uh, numbers which are like proper numbers numbers which are greater than 1 that is numbers which have prime factors and in case you have an additive function what does unique factorization tell you? Okay, so here a symbol which I may or may not have discussed before. We say that a prime power, so we use this notation double bar n if k is the highest power of p such that p to the k divides n. Okay, so if p to the k divides n, but p raised to the k plus 1 does not divide n. Okay? Now, what does unique factorization tell you? Unique factorization tells you that n can be written as a product over all the primes where k is the highest power, suppose k is the highest power for each prime dividing uh, uh, n. If you want to be more precise, this k of course will depend on the prime. So, you will of course use notation accordingly, you can call it k sub p or whatever, but I think we, I think all of you understand what we are getting at. So, uh, we'll just try to avoid notation when not strictly necessary. And what does this tell you about f of n? Because this is an additive function, it means this can be written as a sum of all the prime powers p to the k double bar n f of p to the k if f is additive. If f is strictly additive or rather uh, strongly additive, then what do you have? It is enough to just, uh, so f of p to the k is just f of p. So, we do not have to really know what is the highest power of p, but for any prime dividing n, the sum goes over all the distinct prime dividing n and takes the value f of p for each of them and sums them up if f is a strongly additive function. Okay. So, for strongly additive functions, the study of average orders uh, value distribution, it becomes a little easier, okay, but there is actually not that much of a difference. So, I am just going to assume today that f is an additive function. Actually, I will show you the difference what happens when you take additive versus strongly additive. So, let us start with f additive. And let us ask the question in the setup that we of the probability setup that we defined, what is the expected value of f? So, by definition this is 1 over n, n going from 
1 to n f of n. Because of additivity, what you have is that the term f of n, so you first go and then you have an inner sum of all those prime powers p to the k, okay, which so p to the k double bar n f of p to the k. This comes by additivity, okay. Now, by now you know whenever you see two sums, you have to interchange it. Hmm? So, what, what do you have now? You are basically, by the way, this itself is actually a, there is a double sum here also. You are running over all the suitable primes and the prime powers k. Le, le, let me explain this a little more. So, what you have is in the inner sum p raised to the k double bar n but n is less than or equal to capital N. So, when we interchange summations, we can go first over all those prime powers, so all the primes p and all their powers k such that p to the k is less than or equal to capital N and then in the inner sum consider all those multiples of p to the k okay which are also less than or equal to capital N but because of this fact we have to be a little more careful. So, first you take all those. Uh, so, in the uh, outer sum you take all the prime powers which are less than or equal to n and in the inner sum uh, you take all those uh, multiples of p to the k. So, So, uh, p to the k divides n, but p to the k plus 1 does not divide n. Hmm? So, um, so, all those multiples of p to the k which are not divisible by p to the k plus 1. And since we can actually take f of p to the k outside, Okay. So, in fact, also notice your little all, all these uh, multiples that you have, they have to be less than or equal to capital N, right. So, what you are really doing is 1 over N summation P to the K less than or equal to capital N F of P raised to the K and in the sum, inner sum what do you actually have? If, if you had just had, so actually let me, let me write this a little more clearly. What is the inner thing going over? Okay, so all the multiples of p to the k which are less than or equal to n But p to the k plus 1 does not divide e times p to the k. This is your inner sum hmm? when you do the interchange correctly. So, if we did not have this second condition, if we just had the first condition here, this is something that you already did many times in this course. So, what you have is n over greatest integer of n over p to the k. But then you have to remove those which are divisible by p to the k plus 1. So, how do you do that? You have to take away Is this clear? Now, 
when you have the greatest integer, you can write this as a main term and an error term, right? So, what do you have? So, this is 1 over n summation p raised to the k less than or equal to n f of p raised to the k okay, times, so first just take n over p to the k minus n over p to the k plus 1 plus o of 1. Right? The fractional parts will club into o of 1. So, n times 1 over p to the k minus 1 over p to the k plus 1 okay, plus o. Separate these out. So, you are left with the term summation p raised to the k less than or equal to n. So, n and n will cancel each other and you are left with f of p raised to the k over p raised to the k times 1 minus 1 over p okay, plus the other term, the o term is just 1 over n summation over all the p's and k's such that p to the k is less than or equal to n absolute of Now, so one would expect if the functions are suitably well behaved, then you would expect that this would probably give you the main term and this O term is something that will just become negligible. Okay? So, what we do is, so we expect that our, the expected value of f for very large values of n will basically be the limit as n goes to infinity of this part. This is, you would expect this to give you the main term in the expected value. And of course, we will specify when, when that happens. We will give some sufficient conditions. So, now, on the other hand, if f is strongly additive, Then there is one further step. You still run over all the primes p and all their powers which are bounded above by capital N. But now instead of f of p to the k, you just have f of p since this is a strongly additive function over p to the k where p to the k does not become p. Right? It's just times 1 minus 1 by p okay, plus O of 1 by n f of p. Okay, so now what we do is we are going to give this sum a name and once you have an expected value and you try to derive the variance, okay, this will be a, um, you can take the expected value and you can take the square and then sum them up over all the n's up till capital N. Then a different type of function will show up, okay, which we are going to call, call D following notation in the textbook. So, here is what we do. Let us define in general. So, let us take henceforth we are taking f to be additive, not necessarily strongly additive, where additive is what we can assume. And we are talking about real valued. Let us define E of 
f so e of n comma f to be equal to this particular function sum over all the prime powers up to n f of p raised to the k over p to the k 1 minus 1 over p okay sometimes if it is very clear to us what the function is that we are working with then we may skip this notation and just write it as e of n okay and there's nothing special about natural numbers actually you can do this for any you can define this for any positive real number for any x in r so this is this is a name we give to the sum and we are going to remember this another function we call it d of x comma f okay d coming from deviation okay what happens is so this we are going to define as summation again p raised to the k less than or equal to x okay absolute of f of p raised to the k over p raised to the k there is a square here and we have to take so this whole thing okay which will give you something which is very close to the variance of your arithmetic function and raised to the half again if the context is clear we may just call it as d of x but if you are going to be working with two or more functions then we will have to specify the functions in the notation okay so with these uh, notations in place we prove the following which we call the turan cubilius inequality what does this inequality say it says the following with notation as specified before what happens is that lim so 1 over x summation so there exists a function which essentially vanishes as x goes to infinity so there exists a function epsilon which let's call it epsilon prime such that limit of epsilon prime of x as x goes to infinity is equal to 0 and The following sum which gives you the variance of your arithmetic function 1 by x n less than or equal to x f of n minus e of x comma f whole square it turns out to be less than or equal to 2 plus this into the square of x okay so You can find a function 
which just becomes smaller and smaller as you uh, as x goes to infinity such that this inequality holds uniformly for any arithmetic for any additive function so this uh, epsilon prime does not change if you change f it is some absolute function okay so uniformly for all additive functions f and all x greater than or equal to 2 because this term uh, we are going to take greater than or equal to 2 because any natural number greater than or equal to 2 will have a prime factor. Okay? So, this for, for x less than 2, this is obvious, very trivial. What is this theorem actually saying? Let us try and understand it. This theorem is giving you an upper bound for the variance of your arithmetic function. Okay, in terms of a function that you have defined over here, because what this is saying is that, so as x becomes larger and larger, this part is just becoming negligible. This is just becoming arbitrarily small. So you can think of it as 2 plus epsilon, where epsilon is going to 0. So it is actually giving you uh, an estimate, an upper bound for the variance of your arithmetic function and the other advantage is that it is actually giving you an effective constant. Okay? So, let us in order to understand this better, let us relate it to the function that we have already studied. If you had, so here is a remark before we start proving the theorem, let us make the following remark. So, Suppose your f of n were the prime omega function counting the number of distinct prime divisors of n. First of all, in that setting, what is E of x comma omega? Define this as summation of all possible prime powers up to x. What is f of p to the k? Just 1. So, 1 over p to the k into 1 minus 1 by p. But then as we saw before, the dominant contribution in this actually comes from k equal to 1. So, we separate this into all the primes less than or equal to x, 1 over p into 1 minus 1 by p plus all the prime powers with k greater than or equal to 2 now notice when you have 1 over p square this sum if you take the abs the the sum infinite sum summation 1 over p square we know that converges to an absolute number right so, whether you have x here or not, even if you have summation p less than or equal to x, 1 over p square, this can be written as O of 1. Similarly, for any k greater than or equal to 2, because if you take the summation 1 over p to the k for k greater than or equal to 2, this converges, right? And therefore, this whole thing is also just O of 1. So, the dominant contribution is, as we saw before, coming just from the first term. So, summation p less than or equal to x 1 by p plus o of 1. What was this? We have already worked on this sum. This was just your log log x plus o of 1 which gets absorbed in the already existing o of 1. So, the e or the rather the expected value behaves like this, which is what we wanted. What about d of x? d of x omega. 
what is this by definition again summation p raised to the k less than or equal to x f of p to the k is just 1 1 over p to the k the whole thing raised to the half and again the same thing as above the dominant contribution will come when k is equal to 1 for k greater than or equal to 2 you just have o of 1 so this is just turning out to be log log x plus o of 1 raised to the half so in past classes we had studied we had studied before that 1 over x summation n up to x omega of n minus log log x whole square is less than less than log log x. We had seen this before. So this is a special case here because what all that it is doing is if we apply the Turan Cubilius inequality okay and what you end up getting is 1 by x summation n less than or equal to x omega of n minus e of x which is actually log log x plus o of 1 but you can actually get rid of o of 1 since you have less than less than here anyways. So log log x whole square okay it turns out to be less than or equal to 2 plus epsilon prime of x okay into d square of x which is again just log log x plus o of 1 and again you can uh, maybe you may have to change the constant a little so let's let's call this it gives you an absolute constant you can actually derive what that constant also is it may be a little bit uh, bigger than 2 but you can actually derive a nice bound for a capital C for which such that this inequality happens. So what the Turan Cubilius is actually doing is it is making the above effective. It is giving you the implied constant in this O estimate. All right. So, so now in order to prove the Turan Cubilius inequality, what we have to first do is we have to before I define what this function is, let us just look at this and let us just expand this function. Okay? Just as we had when we started looking at this term, what did we do? We had to apply brute force to first square this. So omega square of n plus log log x whole square minus 2 times omega of n times log log x and then we studied each piece carefully. We have to do exactly the same thing here. So, So you take this now. So 1 by x summation n less than or equal to x f of n minus e of x whole square. I'm just going to write e of x. We know what the function, this corresponds to the function f. How will you expand it? It is 1 by x summation n less than or equal to x f square of n right plus e of x whole square times 
so you have summation n less than or equal to x but the term inside does not actually depend on n ok. So, this is just your minus what do you have here 2 times summation n less than or equal to x times e of x which we can bring out there is also 1 by x and f of n. Okay. Now, what I am going to do is without loss of generality, I am going to assume that x is indeed a natural number. If x is not a natural number, I will leave the work will pretty much be the same. There will be a little bit of a difference. I will let you uh, put that precisely. So, I am going to assume that x is a natural number. So, now what happens? You have 1 by x summation n less than or equal to x f square of n. Okay. What is this actually? The sum of n less than or equal to x times 1 is just x which will cancel off with x here. and minus 2 e x over x n less than or equal to x f of n. So, these are the three pieces that we have to work with. 